So I was asked to talk about uh, the power of repressing emotions. And I believe that the Israeli society has been one that repressed emotions vigorously, forcefully, at least uh, at the early years of the State of Israel when that was deemed essential for the survival of the state. So men definitely, but also women were not expected to show emotions. Even if a soldier died, you were not supposed to cry. You were not supposed to show any, any uh, emotional reaction that was conceived as being weak. And that went all the way towards a culture saying, this is the way you need to live. And the way out of that would be relate to people like you, who also lost someone, and you, they will understand you. So that solves the problem of repressing emotions. I, I can tell you of a, a day when we, we are a, a family that lost a soldier. My, a, a, the sister of my husband was killed in a traffic accident while being a soldier. And I remember the funeral and my father-in-law was saying the, the most important sentence for him was the last one, saying there, there should be peace. Years after, <clears throat> we were driving next to the house of my parents-in-law <clears throat> and my, my son was five years old, and the apartment was dark. And I said, look up, uh, grandma and grandpa are not at home. And he said, oh yeah, they probably went to a funeral or a memorial service. He was five years old. And I decided that we will not support this culture of death at home. I didn't take the kids to the... Uh, cemetery, I didn't take them to memorial services, and I did it so effectively that years after when my youngest son became 11 and they had a lesson in school studying about that, he said, Mommy, do we know any family who lost someone? And then I realized that I overdid it. So repressing emotions has been a culture here. <clears throat> I'm not sure that that was the, of benefit to the people. And definitely not for those who suffer the severe uh, outcome of such repression. My apologies. I didn't realize that I was supposed to rebring it over here. <clears throat> OK. So much. Okay. So we are going to talk about emotional responses as protective mechanisms. And I, th I think at least part of this study was made possible ever since I joined the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Neuroscience because I met people from other disciplines in this field. And I believe that Combining different expertise is essential for addressing such heavy matters. So we are talking about something that happens in the network of our neurons and post-traumatic stress disorder. It has been long for, known for a long time, ever since Walter Cannon uh, discovered it so seemingly, but actually if we look back in history, Herodotus told us about the Battle of Marathon, about this brave soldier who was manly and brave as soldiers should be, and then he lost his eyesight and remained blind forever after. 
So this is definitely a description, not only of PTSD, but of PTSD, which is associated with a physical presentation. It doesn't only affect the brain, it affects body functions as well. Guernica by Picasso definitely shows us the impact of post-traumatic reactions, and so does Walsh with Bashir in our society. <clears throat> but what we need to remember is that PTSD involves re-experiencing, but also arousal and avoidance behavior, and pro-inflammatory reactions, which are something else. So we cannot say PTSD is a problem of the brain and nothing beyond that is relevant. That's not reliable anymore. And what I'd like to talk about today is this uh, association between the suppressed emotions and inflammatory reactions. And I'd like to offer one chemical as relevant, and this is acetylcholine which was discovered by Otto Lowy, then at the University in Graz. And uh, what he showed is that acetylcholine, as a chemical, activates neuronal networks. Until then, it was known. The concept was there is electricity going through the synapse. And suddenly, we learn that chemicals can do this. And acetylcholine controls both brain processes and a communication with the body, including fear reactions. And again, if we go back to history, Seneca told us many, many years ago that everyone is slave to something. We are slaves to the admiration of science, maybe. We like to go to conferences. We appreciate when there are real people there, and not only telephones. So yeah. but. All human beings are slaves to fear, and we need to respect that. And I believe that acetylcholine and its capacity to communicate between brain and body is highly relevant. Definitely, this also goes to genes. And I'm probably the only one here who mentions these uh, dirty words. So our uh, chromosomes include genes. This is the DNA, which is transcribed to RNA that yields the proteins. And there is more to them than that. So I'd like to tell you about the cholinesterase genes, which terminate the acetylcholine signals and therefore are very important for it. And this is a, a Alon Simchovich, who has been a PhD student in the lab while doing his MD studies, and now is one of those interns that hopefully will have shorter shifts, which is good. So uh, years ago, we discovered a mutation in one of the cholinesterase genes, and we warned the person, we, is me and the clinicians with whom I was collaborating, that he should be really careful from taking any medications that affect the cholinergic system. That was many years ago. We did not predict the Gulf War. And in the Gulf War, I was actually sitting with a mask. So we didn't invent masks in this pandemic. And his father calls me and says that his son, who is a soldier, suffered severe psychological collapse. And he doesn't know what happened. And I said, did he take the pills that the army gives all soldiers? Which I knew from my, my own son, who was a soldier then. And he says, yes. And I said, I think that that's the problem. Because those drugs were expected to protect our soldiers from chemical warfare. And they attacked the same cholinergic pathway. And uh, the poor carrier of this mutation was sent to a psychiatrist. He got more drugs. He felt even worse. He stopped taking all drugs, was released from the army, and completed PhD in computation. So he's doing OK. But that means that there might be carriers of mutations that might be very sensitive to changes in a cholinergic pathway. 
the uh, brain on the screen shows you a brain mapping of people who just happen to live next to sprayed orchards because insecticides block the cholinergic pathway. And the uh, frontal lobe shown in red is hyperactive. The deep brain nuclei are hypoactive. They show learning and memory impairments just because they live next to a sprayed region. So insecticides target the cholinergic system of the insect, but we share 50% of the sequence of those genes. So that's not very healthy. If you see a spraying airplane, go away. Don't, don't stand beneath that. In addition to such mutations, we also have mutations in non-coding regions of these genes. And that was a mystery. What is different in those genes? We also know that men and women react differently to drugs affecting the cholinergic system. Again, what is showing? Part of the answer was discovered when microRNAs were found. And Craig Mello and Andrew Fire won the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 2006. And what they showed is that when a DNA gets to be an RNA, that RNA may be blocked, the functioning may be blocked by microRNAs, which are very small, very effective, target regions that do not encode anything. So actually, we have here a new mechanism of action that might control the uh, cholinergic system. So can we look at that in men and women? And I thank Mona Maroon for opening that uh, issue. And what we did recently, together with Sebastian Lobentanzer, who adopted me and our center and came to our retreat here and collaborated with me via internet until I got a message from Frankfurt University that you are the supervisor of this student, which I didn't even know. And uh, he collaborated with Geula Hanin at our lab who did the experiments while he did the analysis of data. And we looked at the genes and the microRNAs expressed by men and women with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And what we found are changes in the cholinergic pathway. So true, as Muna told you, there are differences between men and women, and at least part of that is due to the changes in the expression of these little controllers, microRNAs, in their brain. So is that reflected in the treatment? Actually, PTSD drugs affect the brain, as one would expect, but they also affect the body. And we can't ignore that either. This is Karen Ofek, that was her PhD topic. And then we decided to create mice where microRNA control would not be allowed. So what we did was to overexpress the gene we cloned, the acetylcholinesterase gene, and we took off the region that reacts to microRNAs. So that gene will be overexpressed consistently. And uh, we looked at the brain, the behavior, and the inflammatory system of these mice. And what we found was that the mice keep running all the time. You would say that's physical activity, this is very good, but it's not very good because in serial maze, they totally failed. So they are both hyperactive and stupid. And they have huge inflammation in their intestinal system. So we checked that. We, in that case, is Shanish and Har, today at Tel Aviv University. She was a postdoc here at ELSEC. And what she did was to look for the corresponding microRNAs in the intestinal tissues removed in patients with Crohn's disease. And she found an order of magnitude elevation of those microRNAs, which keeps reminding me that the initial publications on smoking was this calms you down. You know, surgeons were photographed showing, you know, after surgery I smoke because that makes me feel better. 
maybe it made them feel better, but it wasn't a calming reaction. Okay. So can we look at the brain of post-traumatic patients? So uh, Gabby Zimmerman in the lab looked at the brain volumes in patients from the Soroka Medical Center. This was a collaborative study with Alon Friedman and showed declined hippocampal volume, increased pituitary volume, and thinning of the cerebral cortex, which is characteristic of aging brains and associates with weakened uh, uh, cognition. So inflammatory markers may correlate with post-traumatic system severity. How common is this? We know about a lot of famous individuals who were PTSD patients or are. Woody Allen, Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, Princess Diana, Virginia Woolf, Leonard Cohen. I can tell you about a cousin of mine who was uh, uh, 80 years old. He fell and his wife called the paramedics and they found a cardiac issue and treated that but they didn't detect uh, bleeding in the brain and he lost the capacity to speak. So for the next two years until he passed away, he was, uh, uh, couldn't speak. What he did was to press with one finger the other hand and his wife ignored that until a friend who served with him in the army came and said he's sending Morse messages. He says, and that was his job in our unit in the army in 73. He says, we are under the bridge, come save us. And thanks to that message, they did come and save us. And this guy, this was 40 years after, even more. And he was a wonderful family person and a businessman and a, an artist. The only thing we knew about him is that he can't sleep. So he didn't sleep at night. And now I, I'm sure that he was a PTSD patient and that there are many such patients among us. So cholinergic signaling talks to inflammation and vice versa. And this is a vicious circle that we need to know about, realize, and take care of. So how can you check the impact of stressful experiences at a population level. You can find a lot of stories about someone who was exposed to a tsunami and developed a heart attack and dropped dead. Someone else uh, was part of a terrible earthquake. And in all of these anecdotal papers, you find a statement, this cannot be looked at at the population level because there are not, no populations that are consistently stressed. Well, I have an arguing with this statement. I think we all know a population that is consistently stressed. And uh, we decided to check that again together with Tel Aviv University researchers. And we used an old Chinese method, just measuring one's pulse. So you can put your thumb on the other hand and count the number of heartbeats per minute. For grown-ups, it should be around 60, and it should stay that way. If it goes up, that's a bad sign. You need to go to your family clinician and get treated for that. So what we've done is to look at 18,000 people who come in Tel Aviv for medical checkups every year for which the company pays. So Arabs and Jews and Christians and men and women, 18,000 people for four years. And in addition to their documents, they were asked to answer a questionnaire with questions like, to what extent do you fear the impact of terror on your daily life? And what we discovered, and that's again Shanish and Ha's discovery, is that those people who answered five out of five about fear of terror were those with the highest inflammatory markers. So there is an association which 
needed machine learning and 18,000 people, but showed clearly that there are populations under stress. You know, we had this uh, conference in, in the Brain Center recently in the Veilan, and we all sat there and like it was a big event, the new coming center and real meeting with real people. And then the organizer gets up and says, okay, we just heard there is a fire, we need to clear up the hall. And within 10 minutes, everyone took someone else to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem and the hall was evacuated because we are a population under consistent stress and we need to react to realize that. So are microRNAs the end of the story? No, we have recently found that breakdown products of transfer RNA, which is a benign molecule bringing amino acid to, to build new proteins, actually operate like microRNAs. And that under stressful situation like post-stroke blood cells would show a huge elevation of those fragments and microRNAs go down. So I would say the body or the biological system realizes that under acute conditions you need a different set of regulation. Talk about that to us with our masks. So this is a Kasia Winek, a postdoc in the lab, which uh, published this paper very recently together with the same Sebastian Lobentanzer who again did the analysis. So how can we look for the genes and transcripts correlating this? So uh, this is Nadav Yayon, who is now at Cambridge for his postdoc, but we are still correcting his paper, where he looked for the uh, structural aspects and genes that control emotional reactions in juvenile mice. What you do is you take a seven days old mouse a little bit older than the babies uh, Shiratzil was telling us about, and you clip off the whiskers in one part of the face. That's all. Three months later, these mice are discriminated against. They are in social interactions, they are put down at, they are always the subordinate in any social interaction. And what we've done was to look at the uh, structure of their cholinergic neurons and the genes those neurons express. And what we see is a change in the network of genes in the barrel cortex that controls this uh, uh, clipping of the whiskers. And we now have our fingers on the very genes that are responsible for changing the structure of these uh, nerve cells. So that was a long story in a short time, but as uh, we heard before, it's not my story, it's our story. It's a mystery, I like detective stories, so I mourn the passing of John Le Carré, but it was handled by students and postdocs that are extremely talented and I think supported by the multidisciplinary interactions that are offered to all of us at the Brain Center. Certainly you need the financial support, so a lot of foundations are re relevant. And I told you about acetylcholine, about microRNAs, and mutations that impair their function. The newest discovery of fragments of transfer RNA and the population impact that we are now looking at in the context of aging as well, thinking that these RNAs are all so small that they can become therapeutic targets. And RNA therapeutics is not a bad word anymore. Everyone knows what RNA is or asks me. I, I've been involved with a lot of discussions on that. And I thank all of you for listening. <laughs>